what's the number one database? What's the number one country that does it the best? Or I think most interesting players are Vera and Gold Standard. But for something like climate, it's actually like a magical solution. Like blockchain solves consensus problems. Do you still believe it's a good idea? Most blockchains right now are carbon neutral. Uh, so that let's just put that out there. We need to do everything. Yeah. Uh, how far along are we in carbon accounting? Not even close. <laughs> how crypto is entering the space? Crypto used to be really, really bad for the planet with all the heavy computing needs. Hi everyone, this is Dao Heroes, YouTube channel for Web3 professionals. We talk about the hottest topics and trends in DAOs, DeFi and related topics. And today, probably one of the most interesting episodes, we're talking about ReFi, the intersection of climate and crypto. And here with us is Helena Merck from Spirals.so. Welcome, Helena. Hello, super excited to be here. Thanks, Yuri. Yeah, first of all, congrats. You just recently sold your previous company, which was in the boring Web2 space. And, uh, <laughs> and now you're in the crypto land. You were for a long time interested in the personal level in climate and finally doing your own kind of company there. Maybe it starts with your own company. So what does Spirals do? At Spirals, we are building, uh, we're redirecting inflation from proof of stake blockchains into funding public goods, starting with climate and purchasing tokenized natural assets. I won't go into too many details. We're currently in stealth, but happy to, to chat with people one-on-one -on -one, uh, if they want to find me on Twitter later. Uh, maybe give us a quick uh, history. What kind of databases, is it international, local, were used to track it and whether they track like 1% of everything carbon related or like they already had the full coverage? Great questions. Well, I think high level of these carbon markets are a mess and a half. There's ones for every country and then there's multiple ones in every country. Different states have their own, which is why we refer to them as carbon markets, not markets. Depending on the country, they may or may not be regulated. So in the EU, we're seeing a lot of stuff with cabin trade, which is this idea around giving companies basically an allocation of emissions. And if they have, you know, a greater allocation left, they can sell that allocation to another company that maybe emitted too much. Uh, in the US, we operate mostly with voluntary markets. Uh, and that is fascinating. Uh, what it means is that companies purely from either their own corporate social responsibility or end consumer demand are seeking to be carbon neutral, not because the government is telling them to, but because they want to be. Then they start thinking about um, how do they even calculate the amount of emissions they have. So you mentioned like oil and gas companies, but if you even look at something like Microsoft, like they need to figure out the emissions that they have as their company and then down their entire supply chain. And, and where do you stop and where is it your responsibility and someone else's? So there's a lot of different debates happening in like scoping of these. They're called like scope one, two, and three. And I don't think this is the time to go too deep into that, but um, carbon accounting is a huge problem. Uh, I think the coolest company in that space is Watershed. Uh, the people working on that came from Stripe Climate uh, and Stripe Climate is another kind of cool, like actor in the space worth watching. Is it fair to say that majority of those carbon markets, do they track both the carbon credits for the good behavior and the emissions from like the climate destroying behavior or they primarily track the emission part? I guess both, but it's hard to answer that question because there is no like end to end yeah, ledger. Yeah. Each market does it differently. So some markets yeah. only track emissions, some other markets track both the emissions and the carbon capture or carbon kind of positive behavior, let's say. Kind of, but I, I wouldn't even like go that far. It's just, there's a lot of fragmented players. There's people who create credits, there's people who give them stance of approval, and then there's people who use them to offset. Uh, and there's no easy way of doing this. People literally will like call like a carbon credit broker by phone and like try to source these credits from like the Amazon when they're reforcing things. If I understand correctly that the, the first layer is carbon accounting, simply know who is emitting and how much. And then on mm -hmm. top of that, there is kind of incentive design. Either the government says that there are some limits or the government says that if you go above the limit, then you need to pay a fine. Or if you go above the limit, then you need to buy the carbon credit from someone who is below the limit. Yes. Then there's like marketplaces for purchasing carbon credits. And then there's the people who are actually like creating the products on the ground. Uh, how far along are we in carbon accounting? Do you think like every mission is now already accounted and exists in, uh, at least in a uh, centralized uh, network? Or we <laughs> Not even like 1%, close. <laughs> 10%, or like country by country, or maybe which country does it the best or which country you think has a reasonably deep accounting already? Or it's like no one? I don't think anyone has it. <laughs> I, I, so um, the, the, yeah. efforts, the efforts are there, but majority of the emissions are still in none of the systems. What you can't measure, you can't really improve. So I think in terms of looking at like zooming out a little bit and looking at like the, the climate change problem, um, you know, we can't even, we need to both reduce emissions and pull CO2 out of the air. It's going to be impossible to reduce emissions if we don't know exactly where they're coming from. 
Um, so we need to make a lot of efforts on that front, but then we simultaneously also just need to be drawing down carbon regardless of like where the emissions are coming from. What's the number one database? What's the number one country that does it the best? Or like, what are the players to know at, I don't know, at different levels, at the level of regulation or at the level of direct mm -hmm. financial incentives or the level of financial products? I'm most familiar with voluntary markets. So I think we'll stick to that in terms of non-voluntary markets. I think looking at the EU is like really good bet. In, in the voluntary markets, I think most interesting players are Vera and Gold Standard. They kind of issue these standards of approval when someone can prove that they followed their methodology for sequestering a ton of carbon. Various methodologies they have like are mostly nature-based processes like reforestation um, and preventing of deforestation. Uh, we can talk about the quality of carbon credits for hours, but let's stick to like the market side of this. When a, you know, let's say a reforester, so you own a plot of land and you want to grow a set of trees to claim carbon credits from this, you go through a really lengthy process to submit claims that you own the land, claims that they, the land is protected for the next several decades. And then you take soil samples and then people fly out and literally measure every single tree in probably the most inefficient way. And you submit all of this to Vera and years and like tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars later, you finally get these credits that somebody will then purchase from you. There's very limited pre-financing options. It's very hard to figure out, is your land even suitable for a carbon project? There's just an incredible amount of barriers for the people on the land, like trying to do these projects. And many don't even know it's an option. Uh, another big problem is that there's a lot of fraud in the space. Often people will like say, chop down a forest in order to grow a forest and claim credits. That whole space is just messy and, and hard. I think the coolest company doing stuff in just the on the ground reforesting, for example, is this company called Earthshot. So they're trying to build what's called a land OS, basically provide people with everything they might need to start their carbon project. The biggest problem in this entire carbon market is that there's not enough supply. Um, so having people figure out like a really ops heavy solution is insanely valuable. Earthshot.eco, super cool, but they're still kind of stuck with the old cycle of having to take all of that put it through Vera and then Vera then will issue these stamps and then companies like the stamp of approval uh, and they can purchase this and then show their customers that they're green. So my understanding is that with carbon credits, it's primarily focused on the positive behavior, not the negative. You look for people who either capture the carbon or plant the trees or prevent the trees from being chopped up. And then you package that as something that, because you said voluntary market, that means a company that feels a little guilty on like emitting too much or like just emitting in general, I don't know, airplane or data center or something like that, they would go and basically buy that good good work from uh, and to kind of claim credit and like show to their consumers, say, hey, we, yeah, we burn some energy, but look at us, we also sponsor, essentially sponsor forests and things like that. Do you know how much a single tree can make you per year? Let's say I planted a single tree and I, I got through the accreditor and everything was measured and everything was up to standard and I put this single tree on the market, how much can I make? I actually don't have the numbers off the top of my head. I do know for things like reforestation in particular, it's a lot more valuable to keep an existing tree alive than to grow a new forest. And I would go a step beyond that and say, those are both great. We should do both. And we also need to do things like direct air capture and invest in R&D. We need to do everything. And uh, is it <laughs> anywhere close? Let's say I, I own a plot of land and I have a forest there right now. So I can sell it as a carbon capture because I, I, I made a hard promise not to chop the trees. Or I can chop the trees and make it, I don't know, a grazing ground or a farm and like making money in like a uh, agricultural kind of way. Is the money I can make uh, through preservation, like selling preservation of carbon credits anywhere close to the farming income or the disparity is, is huge? I'd say it really depends on the country you're in. Um, so it's really hard to generalize. Um, I'd say the other thing is like, unless you can prove that you would legitimately chop it down, mm -hmm. you can't get credits for that. And even those kind of like threats are seen as like credits based on threats to chop down a forest are seen as really low quality credits. And like, we're trying to not like, those are things that, you know, at least at Spiral's, like we're not gonna like look into purchasing at all. It's very much like frowned upon uh, for many reasons. Yeah, it, it gets into like, hairy, hairy area. <laughs> Let's go to crypto now. So how crypto is entering the space? There are carbon markets that are totally separated, fragmented, different countries, different types of emissions and uh, kind of climate positive behaviors. Some are voluntary, some are enforced by governments. There are creditors who are on the ground checking who actually does good things or bad things. There is carbon accounting. Let's say that infrastructure is in place. We know that it's not there yet fully or it's very limited in coverage, but it's growing, it, it's getting eventually, hopefully. What is the area where crypto can kind of add good stuff? 
One thing before diving into that is making a big disclaimer that crypto used to be really, really bad for the planet with all the heavy computing needs. A lot of people ask me, wait, how can you do climate in crypto? Newer consensus algorithm, which are, you know, the actual ways we sign blocks and, and move things around on the network has improved. So now the computing needs of newer blockchains are significantly less, so much less that it's actually like kind of irrelevant to, you know, harming the planet. Most blockchains yep. right now are carbon neutral. Uh, so that let's just put that out there. Um, yep. <laughs> the second part um, in terms of bringing, like, using crypto and blockchain as like a solution for the climate problem is interesting. I think for a lot of things, crypto is like forced in there and you try to figure out how to web three something. But for something like climate, it's actually like a magical solution. Like blockchain solves consensus problems. It solves massive coordination concerns. That's exactly what climate is. Like climate is a coordination problem. We all need to get on the same page and agree on things and align. And blockchain can be the backbone of enabling that. Blockchain as a tool, and I think the first place we saw that used for climate is Regen Network. They've been around for years. Uh, went through Techstars in like 2016 or 2017 and veteran team of like people from climate. Um, they're basically building an on-chain registry for tokens organized natural assets, starting with regenerative agriculture. A lot of the monitoring they do is automated, which solves a lot of the problems that we've seen in like, you know, the regular carbon market. So they have like remote monitoring, they use satellite data, all the good things, bring that on chain and then have people retire it directly on chain and have a transparent, clear registry on like where those are being sold. So it's like the first time we've seen like an end to end, like carbon sequestered, sold to a company, which is crazy. Not only have they done this for regenerative agriculture, but they've built like the framework for doing this for any methodology. One other concern with companies like Vera, so Vera was the arbiter, the stamp of approval for carbon credits, yep. is that they're really slow. They're this like tiny nonprofit that isn't keeping up with the pace of carbon markets. So when someone develops mm -hmm. a new methodology, like direct air capture, they don't have a way of giving you credits for it. So you spend millions of dollars trying to get it approved. But instead with Regen Network, they make that methodology creation super, super easy. So essentially, you're saying that the first big step that we need to take forward is to increase verified supply of positive behaviors, make it easier for the creators or the suppliers to actually go join one of the marketplaces, get verified as cheaply and easier as possible. Because you're saying that the demand is ahead of the curve. The big mm -hmm. corporations want to look good. The the, the consumers pushing for more projects to actually buy the carbon credits and do their part in the climate preservation. So the, the supply part is one of the broken pieces and there are a few projects who are actually making it easier. But that seems to be still off-chain and still primarily like the traditional part of things. What part of mm -hmm. uh, that stack the crypto can take over? So region network is fully on-chain. They're on-chain end-to-end. They're built on Cosmos. So Cosmos is a way for you to launch like an application specific blockchain. Their yeah. application is carbon credits, essentially. They're entirely on chain. It's like an on chain ledger. And I think they are both tackling the part of the supply side, but then mostly just creating like a framework and transparency across the whole system, uh, removing the need for that like bottleneck in supply that Vera is creating right now. Then additionally, things we've seen more recently. So Regen has been around for several years and they're growing well. Super excited to see the progress. More recently, you might have heard of groups like KlimaDAO and Toucan and a lot of kind of organizations that have created a lot more hype around them. Uh, and for better or for worse, I brought a lot of people into refi. I guess mostly for better. Yeah, I don't <laughs> What they're doing is is really interesting. Regen operates in just creating a new infrastructure stack for all of crypto, all of carbon markets on Web3. Full stack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, full stack. Toucan creates a bridge instead from the old legacy systems on chain. So they look at what is this on Vera right now? Let's tokenize it and then let's make it liquid and bring it into crypto land, which means that every single problem that the legacy systems have are now on chain, which yep doesn't solve, I think, the core problem, which is so supply. Regen is essentially a new supply of good behaviors, and the the other project that you mentioned is the, the existing supply. So it's existing supply that can be purchased through software code, like pooling kind of API methods or on-chain. Correct. That said, they are doing like building the infrastructure for bundling and tokenized carbon credits is extremely yeah. valuable and their mm -hmm. protocol could tap into any other asset, right? It doesn't have to work mm -hmm. with Vera, it just happens to. Um, so it's exciting to see what they expand into. If they're going to succeed, they have to expand past Vera. And if they don't expand past, I don't think there's a future for them. Klima, which is what most people have heard of if they think about refi, uh, was a DAO or is a DAO that raised a bunch of money to purchase carbon credits through Toucan, which meant by proxy through Vera. Um, they're mm -hmm. in intent was to sweep the floor of all the low quality credits. That's a terrible idea. They're signaling demand for really fraudful credit clouds from like 2005. Ones that weren't sold for good reasons because they were not high quality. So they signaled demand for like 
really bad credits, bought them, put them in their registry, and then we saw it collapse. If you look at just like the token price, another thing that was interesting about Klima is that they were fork of Ohm and Olympus Dow, so had very similar like Ponzi style hyperinflation. Got it. So essentially, they, they tried to, to create a token that was backed by car carbon credits, so like, uh, uh, but they, they, they used some sort of like rewards that were unsustainable. Yeah, basically, they built a treasury that actually had no value, which means that the token representing Klima had no value. And, and that's really unfortunate because there was a lot of like positive intent that went into creating a DAO. So essentially, what, what I hear is that a token that represents a treasury full of uh, good carbon, like positive behavior is you still believe it's a good idea, but the initial implementation was like below par. Yeah, that said, I think there were other concerns with Klima DAO, such as like the tokenomics of Olympus DAO, and like I think a lot of opinion people have opinions on that. Mine are mostly negative, but everyone's entitled to theirs. Got it, got it. Okay, essentially what I, what I hear is that where crypto is shining is kind of a programmable layer on top of carbon credit. So either mm -hmm. Vera brings the old carbon credits or Regen brings the new carbon credits, someone else brings the new carbon credit. Someone verifies and hopefully in a more automatable and scalable and transparent and fair and also fraudless way to bring the high quality carbon credits to the digital space. And then crypto takes over and make them composable or like you can mm -hmm. bring five different credits from a different place, make them more accessible for more people, not just buy individual carbon credits. So instead of having like a composite products, I guess, or having the API. So I bought a ticket on an airline. And in that instance, that airline purchased, I don't know, a slice of a tree for me to kind of redeem my, my, my flight, I guess. <laughs> so is that the main application, the kind of the programmable layer on top of verified credits, or there are other like highly promising areas? Yeah, I, I like the way you, you phrased like the programmable and kind of bundling of them. I think that's interesting. It does lead to some potential like concerning paths uh, for the markets. I think the mm -hmm. most like the, the first layer of benefits is like transparency and a, mo a market that can actually operate <laughs> um, just mm -hmm. pure functional. Right. And then all the layers on top around, you know, gaining like earning yield on, on lending carbon, which is like interesting. Right. And then we kind of you know, start building more and more abstractions on top of that and end up in like a really weird place. Then the question you kind of have to ask yourself is like, is creating all these interesting like lending and yield generating things on top of carbon actually helping achieve our goal where the goal is not to make money, the goal is to like pull more carbon out of the air. Does having more economic activity on these abstracted layers help companies like Flow Carbon are betting their company on that? I think Flow Carbon is going to make a lot of money. The question is, are they going to help the planet? It's a, such a high high on the stack opportunity area. So again, we, we discussed that there was actual climate change in behavior, good and bad, like emissions mm -hmm. and planting trees and preserving trees. And then on top of that, re regulation on top of that, there is a verified digital representation of the behaviors like the carbon credits. And then on top of that, there is uh, primary purchases like a company that, you know, made a flight and e emit a bunch mm -hmm. of carbon purchase some trees, uh, digitized trees to kind of offset that. And then on top of that, there is a financial products like lending or packaging mm -hmm. or tokenizing and things like that. And so as you go high in the stack, there are starting question marks are starting popping up is like high in the high in the stack seems like a more financial products and like, and less of a climate protection products. And then mm -hmm. what's the right ratio here? And shouldn't we have more effort and more energy on the lower parts of the stack, like verifying credits and actually incentivize, like making it cheaper to plant a tree or actually mm -hmm. extract the, the carbon rather than just uh, betting and repackaging the, the existing trees and the existing carbon activities on the high levels of the stack. Yeah, you nailed it. It's kind of like the higher level you go, the more it's just you're like moving carbon around in like a little circle, um, not driving uh -huh. more demand. Yeah, let's let's go to two more areas and then maybe wrap it up for today. But it feels like it maybe a multi episode story here. I want to briefly touch NFTs. Do you think NFTs play a role? Do people will buy an NFT representing a single farm, a single tree, or a single something? I think NFTs are a great technology. You want a unique mm -hmm. representation of a thing. That's very valuable. Mm -hmm. We want to know exactly what farm this carbon credit came from and NFTs are the way to represent that. So yeah, I think they'll play a part, but I would separate that from, hey, let's launch an NFT project to fund something. Uh, mm -hmm. The distinction being one is used as like part of this like larger system and the other is a fundraiser. We've seen a lot of like NFT project launches 
to fund a thing. And it's cool that we now have a new way of like fundraising, but I would make sure that in your minds, they're like, so if, if the behavior already happening and this NFT already backed by the good things and by buying that, and you make sure that most of the money in transparent, predictable, verified way actually go to the tree preserver, then it's great. And if it's like for the future activity, then there are a lot of question marks and uh, it's more risky, let's say that way. Got it. And so let's talk a little bit about the DAO aspect. What kind of actors or participants in the ecosystem would actually benefit from DAO structure? Is it the nation states? Okay. Is it the carbon purchases? What type of groups of actors can actually come together as a DAO? So in the refi space, there's a few different areas where I think DAO governance makes a lot of sense. One interesting mm -hmm. one is in the verification itself. So like, did this thing happen? Mm -hmm. Having a bunch of different third party verifiers who can get rewarded for doing this work and providing their work. That's a really, really good use case. Like yep. a decentralized verification system. That feels a, a great fit for, for the DAO structure where you basically join DAO as a contributor. If you have verifier, they develop the common standards. If you like do bad work as a verifier, you get kicked out or you lose your stake yeah. or whatever. If you're doing good part, then you grow in stake and then maybe there is a shared pile of money. You get a, maybe a percentage from the uh, marketplaces that lives above you. So you help to bring supply and you're responsible for that supply of being high quality of uh, like real trees or real farms and things like that. Awesome. This was a great episode. So what we've learned today is that we are very early on. So there is a lot of infrastructure before the crypto, before the digital verification and the actual uh, regenerative uh, behavior like preservation of the trees, planting new trees that needs to be digitized verified brought on the marketplaces marketplace currently very fragmented some only cover emissions some only cover the positive behaviors then those marketplaces needs ideally to come together as fewer marketplace and more fluid follow the same standard to the same protocol the next step is being programmable and then on top of that there is a more questionable or controversial area of pure fintech innovation where you can do like more financing and lending and borrowing money against the carbon credits. There are question marks on the high end of the, of the stack and we, early on. But the, the, what I hear today is that supply problem is the, the, the path from tree being planted or preserved to that tree being fully represented digitally and then played with. Uh, that kind of supply side is the biggest broken piece right now. That was super awesome. And uh, we hope to see you again on the channel and good luck with your startup. Thanks, Yuri. This is great.